Kingdom families on Tuesday. Um, again, mute your mics so that we don't get any feedback. These are being recorded, I hope. And uh, if you'd like a copy of this, see uh, Brother Javier or see Brother Coffee, and they make sure they get these lessons into your hand. These are our studies. And you will have an opportunity to ask any questions if you want to do that as well. Before we get started, let's open up a word of prayer, Brother uh, Coffee. Uh, can you go ahead and just lead us in a prayer, Brother, get us started? Yes, let us pray. Most gracious Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this day and the opportunity to gather together with the saints. We thank you, Father, for your word, Father, which gives us hope. We thank you, Father, for your manservant to put a lesson together for us to learn more about your kingdom. So we pray, Father, that we will open up our hearts and minds to receive what you have prepared in your word. Forgive us, Lord, of our sins. We ask, Father, that you will bless, bless us now in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, my brother. I want to read Psalms 127, just to lay a foundation. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, to watch them awake it, but in vain. It's a vain. It's vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he give it his beloved sleep. Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Yeah. Is a man that had his quiver full of them. Uh, they shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemy in the gate. Uh, tonight, what I want to do is I want to talk about uh, snapshots of a godly uh, uh, kingdom couple. Snapshots of a godly kingdom uh, couple. If you were part of our Acts 5 study on yesterday, I want you to turn there. We have an ungodly couple, uh, Acts chapter 5, that's in the kingdom of God's dear son. Uh, and I want to show you this bad example of a uh, ungodly couple in the kingdom and then we want to look at a godly couple uh, that the Bible talks about and of course you all know we want to represent the godly couple in Acts chapter 5 as uh, we're studying on uh, on Mondays and Thursdays uh, we studied this yesterday there's an ungodly couple by the name of Ananias and Sapphira and I want to read this just real quickly uh, but a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira his wife sold a possession and kept back part of the price his wife also being privy to it brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? While it remained, was it not thy own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own power? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all them that heard these things. And we established in our study on Monday night that what uh, Ananias, and we'll see if, in a moment, so far, what they're doing is uh, they're trying to make themselves be a couple uh, that they're really not. Uh, what they're trying to do is they're trying to uh, concoct a conspiracy against the apostles. They're trying to get in good with the people. And this is a husband and wife couple that actually uh, congregates this plan, okay, together to try to lie uh, to God. And Satan actually, as the Bible says, fills their heart. And so this is who they really are. This is who they really want it to be. And so what happens is he lied to Peter, and, we, and the Bible lets us know he, they're actually lying to God. Verse 6, and the young men arose wound him up and carried him out and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after with his, when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me, whether you sold the land for so much? And she said, Yeah, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that you have agreed together? I want you to get they agreed together. There's a husband and wife. Uh, these are uh, people who have obeyed the gospel, and they're lying about the amount of money and uh, their attitude uh, that they supposed to have uh, toward the people of God. Uh, agreed together to tempt the spirit of the Lord. Behold, the feet of them which have buffet, uh, buried your husband are at the door and shall carry you out. Then she, uh, then fell she down straightway at his feet, yielded up the ghost, and the young men came in and found her dead and carrying her forth, buried her, get this, by her husband, okay? And so this is an ungodly couple. This is a couple uh, that tried to make themselves be something that they're not. And again, it's nothing more or less than conspiracy. And uh, you and I have got to make sure that we are careful that you and I are not an uh, ungodly couple, a husband and wife. And I'll say this, if you have a husband or a spouse, I don't know, the Bible doesn't tell us which one, you know, derived this plan, who thought of it first. It, it, it's irrelevant, really, who thought of it first. The idea is the Bible says they agreed together uh, to do this, uh, to make themselves be somebody or look
look like they're somebody that they're not. And this is not what kingdom families are to do, brothers and sisters, is to, it's a lie and to cheat and to get over and to cause division uh, in the home or in the church. Uh, and we have to understand that God sees and God knows what goes on in, in our home. Uh, but on the other hand, the Bible does show us a picture of a godly couple. And I want to go to Acts 18. How much do you know about Priscilla and Aquila? See, that was, these two are a remarkable couple, brothers and sisters, that we can read about in the New Testament. And you know what? These people, there's no book that they wrote. There's no book of Priscilla. There's no book of Aquila. Aquila. But the Bible uh, talks very well about these two uh, individuals, a husband and wife team. As far as we know, they don't have any, any children. Uh, and the Bible doesn't mention it, if they do. But the idea is, I'm going to tell you, this is a great example of, of kingdom families. And I want us to learn uh, tonight uh, from this particular family, uh, this particular husband and wife team, Aquila and Priscilla. First thing we're going to learn when we turn to Acts 18 is, first, that they were responsible. And Acts 18, look at verse number one. The Bible says, after these things, Paul departed from Athens. He came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought for by their occupation. Notice this, they were tent makers. Now, what I mean by they were responsible is, first of all, these are a working couple. Uh, uh, they are in the business of tent making. They have the same job, occupation that uh, the Apostle Paul had. And Paul becomes acquainted with this particular couple uh, while he's preaching in Corinth. Priscilla and Aquila, and one was Jew. Now, somebody say, well, the, the Bible uh, showed that they had problems. Well, yeah, they had problems because when you look at verse number two, the Bible says uh, they found a certain Jew named Aquila born in, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Now, why are they leaving? Because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome. And so there's a dilemma going on. This is a, a couple that has trouble, but at the same time, they're still being responsible, okay? They're still working. Uh, and that, that's something God wants all of us to do, is to be workers in the kingdom, okay? You need to work. If you're a man, you need to work to provide for your family. And uh, if a man can't work, then the wife, she's supposed to be as help me she can step in and she can help provide like the woman is doing in proverbs chapter 31 okay and so god wants his people he wants kingdom families to avoid being lazy okay and aquila and priscilla were not lazy secondly they they're courageously uh, correcting error. You know, go to Acts 18. You're still there and look at verse 23. They're going to work together husband and wife team working together courageously and lovingly helping Apollos see the truth. In Acts 18 and verse 23, listen at this couple. And after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia and Persia in order to strengthen all the disciples. This is what Paul was doing. Now look at verse 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord. And having been fervent in the spirit, and being fervent in the spirit, forgive me, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom, now listen to verse 26, when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they, notice this, husband and wife team, took him unto them and expounded on him the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass in Achaia, the brethren wrote and told the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much which had believed through grace. For he mighty convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. So notice what Priscilla and Aquila are doing. They're helping Apollos to learn uh, that baptism of John is no longer in business. And so notice his spirit, Apollo's spirit. He received it humbly, which I think is a, a plus on a, a, a Apollo's uh on his account, uh, for him to be able to be corrected uh, and to be humble enough to understand, hey, I wasn't teaching right, I didn't have this doctrine right, John's baptism is now out of business, and he received the teaching of this husband and wife team, okay? And so the question would be, how many Priscilla's and Aquila's do we have in the church? How many husband and wife teams do we have working together? And I think that's what we need to see more of. Husband and wife teams working together for the cause of Christ. That's what we ought to have. It ought not just always be just one person doing all the work. Husband and wife need to be working together in the spiritual work of God. How many of us are inviting people to our homes to share the gospel? Husband and wife team. How many of us are being hospitable in our home? Husband and wife team. 
working together. And I think this is a great example of a marriage, of a, a kingdom couple who understands the importance of working together in the kingdom of God. How many of us on here have had a hackle and Priscilla in our life? I mean, how many of you on here have had some, a couple invite you over and, and talk to you and encourage you and share a meal with you and talk about how they've overcome certain things in their life? See, this is what Aquila and Priscilla, this is who they were all about. And not only that, they worked hard in the church. Go to Romans chapter 16. They worked hard in the church. That's what they did. The church in Rome and Asia, guess what? They met in their house. These people were tent makers, but I'm going to tell you something. They, they worked hard. They, they, they didn't, it wasn't just about going to church with these two couples, with this couple, forgive me, in Romans chapter 16 and verse number 3 through verse number 5. In Romans 16, 3 through 5, he says, now this is what Paul says. He wanted them to greet Priscilla and Aquila. Now, notice what we call them. My helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches, he says, of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved Epinetus, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ. You see this? So these saints are working hard. They are having church, the, the, the church to gather in their home on the first day of the week. Let me tell you something, brother. I want to say this while I'm in this neighborhood, too. A church is not defined by the edifices that they meet in. Some of us are ridiculous about a building. It's, it's ridiculous. We think a church is only a church if they meet in a building. How big the building is, how beautiful the building is. So the, the early church would meet in homes. Homes. And what's wrong with couples, people opening up their homes if, the, if the, your home can facilitate what you and I are supposed to be doing as it relates to worship? This is what Apple and Priscilla did. Doesn't make you a church because you you meet in, in a building. These saints were concerned about the work. They were dedicated to the service of the church. They were invested in the kingdom. And that's what kingdom families are supposed to do, brothers and sisters. And I gotta ask myself, you gotta ask yourself, are you a worker in the church? Go to 1 Corinthians 16, 19. And go to look what Paul says in First Corinthians 16, 19 about these two people. See, Paul loved these. And why? Because like he said, they laid down his ne their necks for him. They laid down his, his their necks for Paul. And that's what godly couples should be doing for the gospel. Laying down your neck for the gospel. In First Corinthians 16, verse 19, the church of Asia salutes you. Now notice he said, Aqua and Priscilla, Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the churches that is in their house. The godly couple, as a couple that were hard, they showed hospitality, which, mind you, is one of the qualifications to be an elder, is that you must be hospitable. And to be hospitable, that would include the man and his wife being in agreement to it, being hospitable. It is a fruit of the Spirit. All I'm saying tonight is they had a godly marriage, brother and sister. Go to 2 Timothy 4 and we'll be done. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 19. They had a totally different spirit than, than Ananias and Sapphira. And I'm going to tell you, all of us are one of these two couples. You're either hindering the work or you're helping the work. Kingdom families. You're either, your family's either helping the work or you're hindering the work by how you live, by what you do, by what you say. In 2 Timothy 4.19, Paul, I'm going to tell you, Paul talks about these things, man, because he, he loved this couple, man. This was, this was a couple that was a great example and a source of great encouragement to the Apostle Paul. In 2 Timothy 4, in verse number 19, again, this is Paul's last letter before he died. You know what he's going to talk about? The people he loved and the people that loved him. This is a, this is, if historians are right, this will be the last letter Paul writes before his imminent death, before he died. This is it. And in his last letter, in verse number 19, he says, salute, 2 Timothy 4, 19, salute Prisca and Aquila, 
and the household of what Nitsa. Notice he brings their name up. You know, it's interesting. Every time their name are mentioned, guess what? They're always mentioned together in the Bible. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? The two shall become one flesh. They are working together. They're working together to correct Apollos. They're working together to provide a place for the saints to come together and to worship God. They're suffering together for the cause of Christ. When you go back to Acts 18 and 2, they're leaving together. They're fleeing because of the decree that Claudius had put out. And brothers and sisters, all I'm saying is God intends for marriage. God intends for kingdom families to be a relationship where two people serve him together. That's what he's doing. Together. Work together. Not fighting with one another. Not comparing each other to each other. Not bickering with one another. But being an example. That's what we need. And Aquila and Priscilla are a great godly snapshot that the Holy Spirit has given us of what kingdom families are supposed to represent. So the question tonight, like Priscilla and Aquila, are you a faithful servant to God? If you're on here and you're married, husband and wife, you're an ill, you're a deacon, are you and your wife? If you're a gospel preacher and you're married, are you and your wife? Are y'all faithful servants to God? Are you showing the oneness that God intended for marriage to be? Are you working together to help save souls? See, they were friends of the gospel together. I'm telling you, they were friends of the gospel and they were working together. And they were working together not for ill will, but for the common good and the common cause of the gospel. And that's what kingdom families are supposed to do. Let's pray. Our God and our Father in heaven, we just thank you, Father, as we just uh, use some selective passage of scripture, Father, to just learn, uh, Father, that it is very possible uh, for us to love you as a godly family, a godly couple, and do all that we can to work together, Father, to bring glory and honor to your name. And Father, we understand Paul, your servant, who wrote the majority of the New Testament, but he understood, Father God, he, he needed help. He needed people who would be willing to make the sacrifice and, and follow, would be hospitable to him to, to lay down their own necks if need be, Father, for the, for the common good of the gospel being propagated. And Father, we need homes, kingdom families, uh, just like Priscilla and Aquila. Father God, couples that will represent and show the possibility, Father God, that when two work together, with, with you, Father, as the common denominator, and, Father, there's nothing that we won't, won't be able to do. And, Father, by doing so, we need to understand how much encouragement that we bring to those that are around us, Father, that we help others to be better and, and stronger in the kingdom of your dear Son. And Father, this is why we have these kingdom family studies, because we all want to do better. Forgive us, Father, where we fell and fallen short. Strengthen us where we will be. And, Father, we make a plea and a vow, Father, that we'll do better in the future than we've done in the past. We love you. We thank you for who you are. Thank you for your word. And this prayer we offer is in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. This time I'm going to open it up for any questions, any concern, any thoughts anybody might have. Any questions, uh, any Bible questions on marriage or anything else uh, tonight. I can't see your hand if you do have your hand up. Anybody? Anybody have their hand up? I, I have a question. Um, um, yes, go ahead, Mom. I can't see who, uh, is that Brother Kennedy? Yes. Yeah, go ahead, um, Brother Kennedy. And, and this, this is, uh, and I, I was trying to get a better understanding of this, um, um, and, and, and it's talking about the eldership. When we, I, I know, I think it was, uh, a comment was made a while back that um, you can start with one, but it seems like when the scripture says to go and appoint elders, it, it, has, it, it says elders as plural. So, um, is is that is that to be taken in the literal, or do we have, or are, are is there a capability of having just one elder in um, in the lowest church? I know I know sometimes we can say like, hey, you know, why not just start with one and then in hopes to build? But is, would, would that be incorrect to have one elder? Not necessarily. No, uh, you know, not. Uh, I want to read the scripture first. What, what scripture? Uh, I just you, know. What do you? What's the scripture you come about? I know Philippians talk about it. I don't know the one you're talking about. 
when you, um, I know Paul talks about an entire, we'll just use Titus 1 5. I don't know if that's what you're talking about or not. We go to Titus 1 5. There's several scriptures that show plurality. Uh, we'll, do, we'll, we'll use Titus. Titus 1 5. I just want to read a scripture that goes with this. Titus 1 and verse number 5. For this call, this is what Paul is still in Titus when he left on an hour of Crete. Okay, and he says, For this call I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I appointed thee. And he talks about it, Paul, uh, in Acts 14, 23, there's to ordain elders in every church. Here's the thing. The idea is we need to understand you are to be working on uh, installing elders, a plurality of elders. That's the idea. You don't just install one person and stop. But the idea is, if I need to know where, and I've said this before, where one is not better than zero. See, what, we, what we're having in the church, see, if there's just one man that qualifies, God wants to see that you're working on it. That's what God wants to see, that you're working on getting elders. You're not not working on getting elders. You're not you're even looking to get elders just with, with zero. Zero. Within three years, and when I look in the Bible, within three years, congregation churches had elders. I'm going to say that again. Within three years, congregations, churches of Christ, had elders. Now, any congregation today that don't have elders, well, I want to know why aren't you working on elders? Why aren't you working on So if you get one, how is one worse than none? It's not. Do you get an elder? We're still working on it. Do you trust God like we trust God and everything else? God will send another man uh, that we're going to look who will be qualified, and then we'll have two. But you can never just be looking to just stop at one. That's the idea. But so the I, I guess that's all I can say on that, brother uh, brother Kenny. It's a great question. But it's this idea of we got to wait until we get two and ins- I need to know where it says get two and install them at the same time. That you got to get to and you got to install them at the same time. I don't see that anywhere in the Bible. Yes, I see a hand. I don't know whose hand that is. Go ahead. Yeah, it's me, brother. Uh, brother okay, Keith. go ahead, brother. Um, brother yeah, Thank you. What, you, what you say, uh, you know, it's true. You know, congregations, you know, it took, oh, let's see, it took 40 years. That's a crying shame. It is. Um, you know, and the premise is the very reason you stated, you know, they tried to uh, use the fact that, uh, you know, we got one, but we need two. And since we can't do a dual installation, we can't have any. That made no sense at all. No. At least to me. <clears throat> so, um, yes. When, uh, when you're striving to serve the Lord, to be set, to uh, be about the business of actively pursuing uh, at all costs, what thus says the Lord. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I'm going to tell you what else some of these guys do, the crooks. This is what else they do. Now, just say you had two and one of them died. Let me tell you what these crooks do. They'll sit them both down. Now you're back to zero. I just want to know, I got two, and we have two at Goose Creek. I die. I'll just use me. I won't put it on my brother. I die. Why does he have to sit down? Why would he have to sit down? Why don't we just work? Why don't the saints just work on getting another? Why does he have to sit down? Because there's only one now. It's foolishness. It's a bunch of foolishness. It's it's, it's set up by men who really don't want elders. Now, y'all can say what you want. Well, brother, and I've heard preachers say, and I am a preacher, that say, I'm not going to put a bulldog in the same gate with me, all kind of foolishness. And I'm not going to put a bulldog in the same gate where I'm at. And so they, they find ways to disqualify people. And I, I wanted to uh, get some clarity on that. I was having a conversation um, with somebody, and I, and I, and I, 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 I had the, those sentiments. I didn't break it down like Brother Stevenson did, but I did. I said, I, I was like, hey, look. Just start with one, and then you know you work towards towards getting two. But to you know um, to just not have, or if one something happens to one, and then say, okay, now we no longer have elders, um, you know, so that person has to step down. But then I, I get that my my follow-on question 
and hopefully he's able to come back on, is, um, and and these are things that I don't see um, in, 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 in the Bible, but just going off of what Brother Stevenson said, he said that um, the intent is to, you know, to work on it. But what if they're not, what if, what if you're not actively working? So what if a person does that? What if there is one elder, but then there's really no plan in place to actively work on getting, you know, the effectiveness of the leadership in the church? Uh, you know, you got no deacons, you one elder, and then there's really no, no plan. How does that work? You just simply just have a church that's just out of order. Right. You know, and the hearts are not right. And so, you know, again, as your brother said, you, you have to start somewhere. You start somewhere and build from there. But, you know, again, I was part of a congregation. It just seemed like there was just no no leadership anywhere. It just wanted to be a one-man show. Right. And, and that's why the, the problems were, the, were there, because there was no other voice. And, and, and the brother was, was afraid to speak up. You know, so it's, it's I had to get out of there. But anyway, that's my comment. Yeah. Yeah, like you said, you know, things become out of order. You're on a slippery slope. And as a congregation, Satan <coughs> uh, will slip in and other doctrines will penetrate. And I've seen churches close, no longer become the church or no longer remain the church of Christ because you don't have sound doctrine. Uh, the elders are there. The bishops are there to provide leadership structure according to the God, and if you uh, disrupt that, then as with any pasture where the shepherd is missing, the wolves will come in and devour them. And that's as simple as it is. Satan will uh, either rise up or he will set up to infiltrate and uh, totally deplete the flock or change the, the whole complexion of church of Christ to something that it's not. All right. Okay. Um, yeah, Brother Stevenson, I just, uh, and um, I had uh, I had expressed to them that um, the, the same lines that you went on is, is kind of like when I, I the, the lines that I went on, I was like, hey, look, just start with one and, you know, you work and develop. But um, I know of a congregation here in the area where I don't see no plan to, they don't have deacons. Um, and you know they now they they now have two elders but there's no effective plan to do nothing it's like they just you know elders and and that's it um and so my, my follow-on question was how, how do you go about that if a congregation only have one elder or if there's no active plan to to, to to you know to put elders in other elders in place or deacons in place you know how do you go about you know remedy or you know, is that something where the brotherhood just get together and they stand up and, you know, you, you come, you know, you, you have those conversations, but if those people are being confrontational and don't want to have a listening ear, you know, here it is as your minister and your elder, like what, how do you, how would you go about that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just what your battle is going to be, my brother. I mean, that's just where the battle is going to be for that congregation. Uh, like we would do with any other false teaching at a congregation. See, they're going to have to prove the scripture. See, a, a, a congregation is not healthy without church government. That's what we have to understand. Your, a church cannot be healthy without church government. The body, that congregation is sick. See, they can't do James 5. You know that? They can't call on the elders of the church. We don't have any elders. So you're preventing people from being spiritually healthy when you don't set up God's government. That's what they hate. They hate God's government. Now, I need a scripture that says that they installed all the elders at the same time. See, I need a scripture, just like we were talking on the last study, about somebody saying something when they're baptized. I don't see anybody saying anything while they're baptizing anybody. Now, I need a scripture that says when they installed the elders, as Paul told Titus in Titus 1, that he installed them at the same time. What scripture says that? I don't see one scripture that they installed, installed ordained elders in every church and they installed them at the same time. I don't see that nowhere in the Bible. So one is better than none. And the reason they won't get one is because they don't want to. That's why. That's why they won't get one. Because they don't want none. That's why. All right? 
It's a great, great question. Uh, anybody else? Any other questions? Uh, Brother Andrew, your hand's still up? No, but you, you made a great point. You know, I, being in the uh, uh, in my experiences in that, that unfortunately, uh, you uh, sometimes in the midst of a congregation that's steeped in the tradition of man, the rudiments of the world, but not after God. And because of that, you have all these rules and regs that God never installed, never uh, set up. And, you know, you wind up with individuals who are controlled and uh, eventually lost to the world. Uh, because ultimately, that's the direction that congregation has gone. I've even seen congregations uh, close as, uh, as of not uh, too long ago uh, because of such things. So it's very mm -hmm. important that uh, church is installed. Uh, elders and deacons set it up according to what thus said the Lord. Otherwise, uh, Satan will come in and he does that. Yeah, go to Ephesians 4 real quick. I know that he's Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4 on this subject. Is that again, a, a congregation cannot be healthy. Will not be what God wants it to be if you're not working on and getting church government. That is the work. That's what every congregation should be working. That's why Paul is stressing that society. You get there and you set up some government, set up some ill. That's what you do. You 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 keep you set it in order. Any church that's not working on elders, you're not setting the church in order. It's out of order. I don't care all the other stuff you're doing, knocking doors and 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 and, and going out to the community and and to get them into a sick church. And you're going to kill them. Eventually, they're going to kill them. That's what's going to happen. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists. Here's, here's it is. And some pastors. Y'all see that word there? Pastors and teachers. Now, when you get that teachers, I'm going to say this. You and I need to stop looking, if we're doing this, looking down on Bible teachers. A congregation needs Bible teachers. Deacons would fall into this category. Any congregation. Now, who's going over here saying, well, church don't need any teachers? Teachers are important. You've got to have teachers. And just like you've got to have pastors. And they're going to tell you why. For the perfecting of the saints. For the work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. Y'all do know a preacher's not a pastor, right? Unless he's qualified to be a pastor. Every preacher's not a pastor. Because a pastor is an elder. That's what he's talking about there. See, we we have some church of Christ just uh, as unhealthy as the Baptist calling your preacher a pastor when he's not a pastor, an elder. That's unhealthy. Unhealthy. Church of Christ needs some government. And that's what they need to be working on. And they refuse to work on that because they don't want none. And that's why that congregation, whoever it is, is sick. It's sick. And it won't be long till it dies because it's unhealthy. Okay? Any other questions? Any questions? All right. Thank you all, saints, for being on here tonight. Appreciate it. Uh, any prayer requests before we close out tonight? Any prayer requests? Uh, any prayer requests? Okay. Well, if not, okay, go ahead, Brother Coffee. All right. Just keep my mother in law in prayer, please. Sure will, my brother. Uh, brother Williams? Oh, yeah, I got, I'm trying to get some clear understanding on what we're just talking about okay sure my question is this here <clears throat> a congregation without an elder is a sick congregation is that what i'm hearing if they're not working on it okay 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 yeah. that clears it up for me thank you brother yeah if they're not working on it that's the idea you you and i if you have a congregation that don't have elders what the preacher should be doing, the evangelist should be doing, is stirring up the desire for men to be elders. That's, that, that's his job. Just like what Paul is telling Titus, this is your job. You need to be going set the church in order. That's what he asked your job. And if the evangelist ain't doing that, he ain't qualified. He need to sit down. If that ain't his church, just getting up there preaching sermons and not trying to develop elders 
He's doing a pitiful job. That's what he is. He's a pitiful evangelist. Because just standing up there preaching sermons and not and not setting the church in order is a detriment to the body of Christ. That's just what it is, brother. That's how God got this thing designed. So you got to be working on it. That is the work of an evangelist. Set the church in order. See, but if I want to be the, 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 the HNIC, then I won't do that. See, I won't do that because it's all about me. Right, right. I'm running the show. See, and that's going to that's gonna be a problem with the Lord. That's what that's going to be a problem with the Lord. Okay? That clears it up for me, brother. Thank, Thank you, you my much. brother. We need to go back to our various congregation. We ain't got elders. We talk to that evangelist. That's what he needs to be working on. And he can start with one. Maybe he qualifies. And he needs to be one. He'd be looking for somebody. And the congregation need to hold him accountable to do that, too. Okay? Anybody else? All right. All right. Well, let's, let's go to our Father in prayer. For God, our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your word. And Father, we quote the scripture all the time. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. And it's profitable, and we believe it, for doctrine. It's for reproof. It's for correction. It's for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Your word tells us how to function and how the church should function and how we should behave ourselves in the household of God. And we thank you, Father God, for your word, which guides us into all truth. Father God, help us, Father, as kingdom families to be good husbands, to be good wives, to, Father God, represent the kingdom just like Aquila and Priscilla did. Father God, just to do the work that is required for us to do, not that we get glory, but, Father, that you get glory at the end of the day because life is all about you, and grace teaches us that we should deny all ungodliness. Father, help us not to have a spirit as Ananias and Sapphira to allow Satan to fill our home to come against the bride of Christ, the church, the people of God, whom your son died for. Help us to love the brethren, love the church, and understand we are just members of the church, and no individual is the church themselves. And you teach your bride how to operate and how to function. And Father God, we do your will, your son's will, and we allow the Holy Spirit by the word of God to direct our footsteps in what we do and in what we say. Father God, we ask for forgiveness where we've fallen short. But Father, we also understand that you have given us a spirit, not of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And help us, Father, to believe it and live it, because that's exactly what faith is. It's living like you're telling the truth. Father God, be with our brother Coffee, his mother-in-law. Father, you know all about her. We pray that you hold her up on every lean inside. And dear God, you give her what she stands in the need of because at the end of the day, Father, we know you know us all better than we know ourselves. When the scripture teaches us that you know the number of hairs on our head is something we don't even know about ourselves. So Father God, just help us at all times to trust in you and to not lean on our own understanding. Father, we love you and we thank you for the sacrifice that you've given us in your son Jesus. Now, may the grace of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with every family represented on this Zoom call is our prayer. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you're on here tonight, you're not a Christian, obey the gospel. Hear, believe, repent, confess that Jesus is the Son of God. That's the confession that's made, Romans 10, 9, that you believe, even as we speak, he is the Son of God. And when you're for your confession that he's the Son of God, Romans 10, 9, you get baptized in water. That's how you call on his name. I'm calling on him to save me in the water. By being baptized, you're saying, I believe he died, buried, and rose, and the Lord will add you to the people of God, the church of Christ you read about in the Bible. Exactly what they did in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, where 3,000 souls were added by the Lord to the church, the people of God, Acts 2, 47. And so if you can... If you haven't been baptized, you can get with the person that invited you on this Zoom, and we'll uh, put you in the right place with the right man so you can get baptized and obey the gospel, okay? And so thank you all for being on here tonight. Next study, Lord, will be Thursday on Brother Green's Zoom page, and we'll be uh, this Thursday, Acts chapter 6, okay, at 7 o'clock. All right, saints, nothing else. Love you all. The love of God. You all have a great night. Good night. Have a good night. Good night, saints. Good night. 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 Good